Chapter 9. Get the triple meet or get nothing. The principal called a meeting in the gym with the entire school. He demanded to know who had caused the destruction to the library. Benny and I could say nothing without giving away our identities. I saw Juanita sitting several bleachers down, her face pointing toward. She never looked at anyone. Finally, we were sent back to class. Benny and I didn't get a chance to talk until after school. I got off the bus and followed him to our room, where he immediately grabbed a comic book and flopped down on his bed. Benny said, Benny, I said, why did you tell Juanita your power? We're superheroes, he shrugged. We don't lie. The superhero code lets us lie to villains, I reminded him. Yeah, I know, but still. He put the comic book down. I felt like we could handle anything she threw at us, the honest way. We didn't need to lie about our powers. I raised my eyebrows. You thought that you and I could stand up for a super super? With your belly button button trick and my polyester power, I didn't even have any matches. It's not a trick, Benny said. It's a power, and we did and we did stand up to her. I'm pretty sure we won that battle. I don't know about that, I said, but I'm pretty sure the library lost. Benny and I got off the bed and started and started his push-up routine. How many are you going to do, I asked. Eleven. Benny grunted as he struggled to lift up his frame off the carpet. I counted as Benny did eleven push-ups and then one more. Twelve, Benny said, collapsing on the floor and then rising to a kneeling position. At this rate, I'll be, I'll be up to a thousand by June. Do you really think Juanita got a worthless power, I asked. Maybe, Benny said. Her story about the light shifter makes, makes sense. None of it makes sense to me, I said, rubbing my forehead. Dad poked his head into the room. Ah, oh, Rafter, there you are. How would you go? How would you like to go on patrol with me tonight? Patrol is just what it sounds like. Every night, one of the Baileys goes out to the city looking for the Evidors. Evidors, evil doors citizens committing crimes. With a million people in Split Rock, you'll think patrol mean a night would mean a night of action and adventure. It doesn't. The citizens of Split Rock know that superheroes roam the city, so they tend to be on their best behavior. Frankly, patrol is boring, but after talking to Juanita, I have a few questions for Dad. Okay, I said, right after dinner. Yep, Dad said, eat hearty and dress warm. Tonight, we battle the criminals. After dinner, I changed into my patrol clothes. I pulled some thermal underwear on and then pair of black jeans and black hoodie. I wouldn't need any of this when I got my super suit. I grabbed a ski mask and my phone and headed downstairs. Dad was waiting for me in the root cellar. He had no longer looked like the skinny guy who wore a pocket protector and a bow tie to the office. He wore his super suit. The titanium plates were molded to look like bulging muscles. His green and yellow costume was clean and wrinkle-free. He looked heroic. He looked super. If you were a bad guy, you wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. Dad and I followed the tunnel back to the back exit. I climbed up a ladder and opened a hatch. A few small trees and some brush provider provided cover, and we slipped into the night without anybody noticing. The air was cold, and the stars shivered in the night. Night sky. Are you ready, Dad asked. And without waiting for an answer, he grabbed me around the waist and leaped into the dark. I love to fly. Not the kind of flying that's done in a plane or helicopter. The real kind of flying, when there's nothing between you and the whole world. It's something I'll never grow tired of. I watched the earth fall under my feet. Dad held me tight, and even thousands of feet up, I felt safe. The worries and cares of the past two days seemed to fade into the background. The frigid air bit at my face, so I put on a ski mask. Where are we going tonight, I asked, yelling yelling to be heard over the rushing wind. Wherever there is danger, Dad declared in his boom, booming superhero voice. I could tell Dad secretly wished for a crime wave, something to make, make patrol a bit more exciting. But Split Rock had been in solid obedience waves for years. Let it, let's go downtown, Dad said, by the public library. You never know what wild and crazy things might be happening in the library. And and I remember the shelves, books, and dust crashing around the school library. Oh, right, Dad said. 
Deb flew towards a group of skyscrapers. He soared in, the, in between the buildings and around them. I held out my hands and felt the wind bite at my fingertips. Nothing was happening at the library or the city center or the taco shack next to the city center. Dad was about to fly his favorite tire store when he was about to fly to his favorite tire store when pulling when he pulled up short. What have we here? I looked to see where Dad was pointing, a guy crossing the street. Exactly, Dad replied, and looked where he was going what he was doing. Right in the middle of the block, that's my son, is called Jaywalking. We caught him red handed or red footed in the case as the case may be. Dad deposited me on the limb of a tree. You wait here. Oh, and take this. He pulled a small camera out of his utility belt. If I look particularly heroic, snap a picture for the family website. He floated down the, man, the down to the man, but this time was getting half into his car. I watched Dad pick him up, carrying, carry him halfway down the block, and drop him gently onto a crosswalk. No need to thank me, Dad called as he flew away. I could hear the... I couldn't hear what the man was yelling, but it didn't sound like he was shouting, shouting his thanks. That guy was al- was almost in his car, I said when Dad t- returned to the tree. Now he has to walk all the way around. Yes, Dad said, but now he's obeying the law, and he'll, have to, and he'll be able to sleep better because of it. Dad took the camera back for me. How did I look? Did you get a picture? No, I said. It was too dark. Sorry. We spent the next two hours flying around looking for murderers, thieves, or perhaps another jaywalker. We found nothing. Dad finally stationed us on top of the bank of a bank. I think he was good. He was hoping for a good old-fashioned robber to drop in and attempt a grand heist. Sometimes, sometime around nine o'clock, the temperature dropped below freezing, and I started shivering. Can I take you back home if you want, Dad? Dad offered. I feel bad. My super suit keeps me nice and toasty. I'm okay, I said. I decided it was time to talk. I didn't know exactly how to bring up the subject, so I did. I did it in a roundabout way. So, what news have to say about the diamond heist? I said. Dad shrugged. If you read the, new- the right news, they commend the actions of the Johnsons and praised us for saving the day. And what did the wrong news say, I asked. Something about destroying a national treasure, Dad said, which I do feel bad about. Maybe Jessie got a little overexcited with her lightning, but still, the Johnsons would have stolen the diamond if we hadn't stepped in, and who knows what evil purpose they would have used it for us. Used it for. Didn't we kind of mess things up, I asked Dad. Well, I guess that's one way of describing it, Dad looked, Dad, Dad looked thoughtful. It certainly wasn't a battle we'd highlight at a reunion. But think about it. Before we got to that museum, they only had a huge diamond, and it cost millions of dollars to own. Even if you can't afford it, what are you going to do with it? You can't exactly make an earning out of it. The weight would tear you, your ears clean off. Now, they had lots of little diamonds that won't tear anybody's ear off. Dad's explanation wasn't helping my confusion. Dad, have you ever wondered, I mean, what if the Johnsons aren't evil? What if they think they are superheroes, just like us? I shook my fist, but only barely. Dad looked over at me. I expected him to laugh, or to tell me that I was crazy, but he didn't. You're growing up faster than I like, Dad said. What are you talking about? I remember having the same talk with your grandpa, Dad said. It's part of becoming a superhero. I didn't follow Dad finally continued. You have to remember, son, that supervillains are masters of deception. In comic books, they had a, the bad guy is easy, easy to spot because he wears a black costume and has an evil-sounding name like Lord Agony or Mr. Meanie Pants. In the real world, things aren't so obvious. The Johnsons, Dad shook his fist, spent a, lo- spent a very large portion of their time spreading lies about us, us to the good citizens of Split Rock. All you have to do is read the wrong newspaper or the wrong blog, and you'll find somebody who has have some. You'll find people who have been tricked. It's all part of the super villainy, and they're very good at it. I remember Juanita's face in the library. Juanita told me she got a worthless power too. I don't think she was lying. 
At least, not about that. She's a super villain, Dad said. She's probably been taking lying lessons since she was three. <laughs> lying lessons? Yeah, from her family, Dad said. Or maybe from the internet. You can find anything on the internet. I once found a video that taught you how to tap dance the Canadian national anthem in Morse code. I didn't think Juanita had been taking lying lessons on the internet. But Dad did have a good point. If the Johnson were villains, of course they were good at being li at lying and deceiving. But why? What were they up to? The important thing is this, Dad said. All of your life, your mom and I have taught you that the Johnsons are villains, and it's true. They are. But now you have to discover that for yourself. You can't take my word for it. You're going to spend the rest of your life fighting the Johnsons. Then you need to find it out for yourself. How do I do that, I asked. Well, Dad said, when I was your age, I read, I read the newspapers. I went to the library and looked up books. You can probably do the same thing on Google. I'm convinced that when you look up a bit at the big picture, you'll come to the same conclusion. I looked down at the street below. The wind, the wind blew a few scraps of paper and leaves to the deserted trees, and I thought it was strange that a place could be so busy and loud during the day, but so peaceful and still at night. And that's when I saw it out of the corner of my eye, a glint of light, down at the drugstore across the bank. At first I wondered if I had seen anything, but there in the darkness of the street I saw it again, a small flicker, a flashlight, of a flashlight. Dad, I said, pointing, there's something going on down there. What? Dad sounded excited. Where? Is somebody doing something evil? I don't know, I said. I saw a light down at the drugstore. Hang on, Dad said. I'll switch to infrared and we'll get, get to the bottom of this. Dad twisted a few dials on his belt the belt of his suit. Wait, that's not the right one, he grumbled to himself. That's the humidifier. Darn it, now I'm all moist. Ah, there we are. Go, infrared. I waited while Dad stared across the street. Finally, he spoke. What have we here? I believe we have an actual crime in progress. It looks like a couple of teens. They're in the candy aisle feeding their sweet tooth. Or would it be sweet tooths? Sweet teeth? That doesn't sound right. It doesn't matter. They haven't learned the cold, hard facts about the consequences of committing crime when superheroes are on patrol. Come on, son, let's go. Before I could say anything, Dad grabbed me and, strep and stepped off the ledge of the building. We flew over the top of the drugstore and landed in the alley. Sure enough, the back door was propped open with a plastic milk crate. You wait here, Dad said. I'll be back in a flash. He grabbed his sleeve. Hey, wait, aren't you forgetting the superhero code? Dad stopped up short. What do you mean? There are super... There are two superheroes on patrol, I said, and I'm the one who spotted the crime. The, super, the superhero code says I get to make the arrest. I could see what Dad was thinking, as plain as if he'd said it. But you don't have a power. Instead, he replied, you're right. I'll let you go first. But I'll be right behind you if you need help. Remember your training. Catch them by surprise. Declare your authority and get the situation under control. I nodded. My hands shook through through fear. Out of... Through though out of fear or excitement, I wasn't sure. This could be my chance to save the day. Opening the door, I slipped inside. Dad followed me, and we, f and we found ourselves in the store stockroom. Boxes sat on the shelves, stacked almost to the ceiling. Pallets leaned against one wall. Voices drifted off from the front of the store. We could just make out what the intruders were saying. I get a few more hot, po get a few more hot pockets. You know how much I love those things cheese and broccoli what are you do what are you some kind of health nut get the triple meat or get nothing a second door led to the front of the store i peeked through the round window that reminded me of the porthole two the figures boat. huddled next to a freezer unit the intruders were older than me probably in high school one of them wore a bright puffy yellow jacket the other had a sweater the one with the yellow jacket poked th through the freezer while the teen wearing the sweater held a bulging pillowcase Yellow Jacket dumped a few packages into the pillowcase. Hey, you know what we forgot? Sweet Tarts. Sweet Tarts, said the teen with the sweater. Sweet Tarts are for sissies. I like them, Yellow Jacket protested. They're sweet and tart at the same time. It's a marvel of modern science. I felt a bolt of courage. These aren't the kind of criminals who would carry weapons. These are just a couple of goofballs taking advantage of some poor shop owner. I could do this. I looked back at Dad and gave him a thumbs up. He returned my gesture. and nodded. I took a deep breath. Iron resolve, ferocious courage, and healthy dose of insanity. 
I, I adjusted my ski mask, lifted a foot, and kicked open the door. It made a satisfying crash against the wall. Both boys jumped in surprised as I stormed into the room. Stop right there, citizens. My voice was strong. I felt like I had the right balance of authority and command. We are superheroes and you're under arrest. Catch them by surprise, inform, inform them of your authority, and quickly get things under control. Textbook entrance executed to perfection. Only it didn't work. Sweater took a look at me and burst out laughing. Nice ski mask, little man. I looked behind me. Dad hadn't followed me into the room. Yellow Jacket grinned and pointed, I've heard of people like you, superhero wannabes. You don't have a power, but you dress up and start pushing into other people's private affairs. He snorted. That's a little embarrassing, kid. And your costume needs work. Are those pajamas under your pants? It's thermal underwear, I said. It keeps me toasty warm. I decided I really needed to work on my comebacks. My face felt hot under my ski mask. For a brief moment, I wondered if I had any polyester in it. Maybe I could try to impress them by striking a match on the side of my head. I didn't realize you freaks started so young, Yellow Jacket said. You're an embarrassment to the real superheroes. Why don't you just go back to your mommy and leave this kid to me? The voice came out behind me. It sounded mean. I turned. What I saw made my stomach flip. A third man with a shaved head stood leaning against a freezer. He chewed on a pencil and his glove, and he had gloves with the fingers cut out. Stubble darkened his jaw. The man, the bald man growled. He pulled the pencil out of his mouth. I told you guys we couldn't be seen. He took a, bit, a, few, he took a few steps towards me. Now I think we have to get a little bit messy. He returned the pencil to his mouth. I tried backing up, but Yellow Jacket and Sweater were right there. They had me by my arms and I couldn't break free. The bald man was moving towards me and then stopped short. He looked over my shoulder and his eyes became dark and slits. I didn't, I didn't need to turn around to know that dad had finally entered the room. Stop right there, citizens, dad's voice boomed through the store. We are superheroes and you are under arrest. I heard the boys gasp. They let go of me, but the bald man stepped forward. I watched as he reached behind her, his back and, flat, and a flash of steel shined in the, in the darkened room. Dad, I shouted, rolling to the side of the aisle. He's got a gun. A gun? The Johnsons didn't use them, and neither did we. Dad's super suit could stop bullets, but there were plenty of spaces a shot could slip through and do real damage. Dad's power was the ability to fly. Bullets would kill him just as fast as they would kill anybody else. I couldn't look away from the barrel as the man lifted the gun and leveled it at Dad. I'll never forget what happened next. Dad could have grabbed me and ran. He could, he could have moved to, to safety and called for backup, but he didn't. Because my dad is a superhero, he lowered his head. His helmet was titanium and in cavular weave, and this would protect his face. The gun fired three times. I heard the ping of bullets hitting the metal, but in two quick steps, Dad was next to the bald man. Then he swung his fist. The gun went flying. Dad grabbed the man by the wrist and pulled him forward and dropped him on the ground in a single motion. Dad's voice was low and steady. Nobody pulls a gun when my son, son's in the room. Is that understood? The bald man nodded. And take your pencil out of your mouth. You look like a beaver. Just like that, it was over. Dad must have already called the police because I heard sirens in the distance. When the police arrived, Dad escorted all three of the criminals out to the patrol car. He gave one of the officers the gun. I sat down on the crate outside and waited while Dad answered questions. The police officer wasn't very friendly, probably because now he had to fill out paperwork explaining how superheroes had found and stopped the crime that he hadn't even known about. Dad answered all the questions with patience. I closed my eyes. I could still see Dad, lowering his head, lunging forward, and saving the day. My dad a superhero, and so everyone else in the family. That much I knew. Juanita had claimed her family were superheroes. I couldn't believe it. The Johnsons were villains, and they were up to something, something big. If I could find out what worthless power or not, maybe it would be my chance to save the day.